This morning we're going to be looking at this famous scene in Scripture. Uh, uh, but as we look at it, I want to once again challenge you, as I often do, to put a skin on this scene. <clears throat> uh, I, I typically like to get our minds, our imagination involved in some of these settings because oftentimes uh, you can look at some of these scenes and if you can put yourself in the story, you can pick up on things that you might not pick up on otherwise. You'll see that here in just a moment. Um, well, let me once again explain that in this setting here, it's right outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And just so you'll know, the cities during this period of time, typically any, any city of significance was surrounded by walls. And at night, they would close the city gates. For example, Jerusalem had 12 gates. And they, they, would, surround the, uh, they would close the gates at night for security purposes. But during the, gate, all, during the day, all of the gates would be open. And what would happen at the city gates was a lot of stuff. Obviously, there's people coming and going, but there was also times where they would have a lot of vendors that would um, sell items inside and outside the city gates because you have people traveling from region to region, and they would pass through these cities during the day when the gates were open, and they could restock supplies on their way to, as they were continued traveling. There was, was also the place where uh, people in society were looking to get wisdom or to have situations, uh, have like an arbiter, uh, arbitrator kind of talk with them about a situation. They would do it at the city gates. And so the city gates oftentimes had a lot of, of, of commotion anyway, a lot of activity going anyway. So the first piece that I want to give you to imagine uh, in this situation is the, the setting of all of this occurring Likely, and it doesn't say specifically, but just going look at the, the typical norms, is just inside and just outside of the city gates uh, going on here in Jerusalem. Now remember that Jerusalem and most cities were cities uh, kind of up on a hill. And I want, I want you to get this image right here. Jesus in this scenario, he's leaving a, 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 a kind of what we would call a suburb of Jerusalem, uh, Bethany. And he's leaving, and it's just, it's a couple miles outside the city, even, you know, if you were to go there today. And he's heading into Jerusalem. Now, this might sound funny, but I want you to just imagine for a moment that Jesus, as, as funny as this might sound, that Jesus was, was at Albertson's, okay? And he's coming up Church Street, and he's going up Sea Hill. And imagine the city gates are up Sea Hill. It's kind of the image I want you to get in your mind, and you'll understand why I say that. Now, look. Right here, we're going to look at verse 12. We're going to start right here. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. It says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now stop. Understand this. And when it says that there was a large crowd, you know what that means in the, in the original Greek? It means there's a lot of people. Um, so <laughs> uh, it says that, that they had come to the feast. Now it's very significant because uh, in, in the Jewish culture, they would have the spring feast and the fall feast. The spring feasts were all within a few days. There was four feasts, but the focus of it was the Passover. And so there, there's all of these people that came from around, and I'll get into some of that in just a moment, and they're there. So there's many people that are gathered there, and they were there because of the feast of the Passover. Verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus, Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead Continued to bear witness. Now stop there. This is significant right here, what we're about to see, because it says that the crowd that had been with him sometime not long before, when he had called Lazarus out of the, the grave, was in Bethany, which is where he's coming from. So we don't know exactly how long before it was, but that was where he was when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And all of those people that saw that went around telling everybody. They were bearing witness. They were telling people of what Jesus had done. Keep that in mind. Verse 18. 
The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. I'm, I'm going to build this for just a few moments as we go through this. I'm going to keep building something because what I want you to see there is, if back there, Damon, if you would, if you would put up on the screen, what, just a moment, I didn't intend to do this, but I'm going to do this again. Look, put verse 13 up there on the screen again, if you would. Notice there it says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him crying out. Okay, let me say it like this. Hosanna. Hosanna. <laughs> no, notice the exclamation point. There was, there, was, there, was, there was an expectation. I want you to get this. There was an expectation. They were passionate about what they were saying. There was something building going on right here. Now, look over at Mark chapter 11. Same story. Going to give us a little bit more insight. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage uh, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter in, you will find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Significant detail. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away, and they found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the, those standing there said to them, what are you doing uh, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. In other words, their outer garments. They threw it on it, and, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road in front of him, just kind of help, helping to paint this. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, once again, look, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, exclamation point. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Now, I, I want to take a few moments here to point out some key things, especially the cultural and prophetic elements of this scenery that we should make note of as we read through these passages. Now, just so you'll understand... There, when you're unpacking a passage of scripture, one thing that you've got to, you, you'll never understand it on the, de um, on the depth that you, sh you could understand it unless you understand the culture of the day. Because the culture of the day explains some things. But there's also a certain passage of scripture like this where God is teaching us what we see, but something on a greater level, the prophetic side of things. Because sometimes it is impossible to grasp everything intended if we do not look at some of those significant things. So follow me as, as we take a look at this. Let me begin with the cries and the shouts of the people as Scripture makes it clear once again that they are screaming out, they are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as they quote a, what we call a messianic prophecy from the book of the Psalms, Psalm 118. The messianic prophecies were written hundreds of years, most of them, before Jesus actually came in the flesh uh, as Jesus, as the Messiah. But they were these prophetic pictures where God gave us glimpses of who Jesus was, who he would be, what his role would be. They all always pointed to his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his second coming, all of those kinds of things. So obviously this would be significant because Hosanna means save us. And more specifically, it means in this case, save us now, since Jesus even himself said that his mission was to seek and save the lost. Now, while these people were meaning to cry out, save us, in their minds from the Roman Empire, see, they were under the oppression of the Roman Empire at this moment, prophetically, they were crying out, save us from our sin. They didn't realize this, but God will allow his people to speak some things so that he can work through the avenue of our words to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And so while the situations they said, save us, meaning from the Roman Empire, Jesus was allowing them to say this so that he could use their words to bring in the salvation of their sin. Now, secondly, I want to point out, as they were speaking this, they were also spreading palm branches on the ground in front of Jesus. Now, these type of actions were typically 
what would be done for the welcoming of a king, especially one that was returning home from a battle. So ju just a side note, if you go read over in 2 Kings, you'll also see in chapter 9 that this was part of uh, the coronating of kings in, in, their, in their culture. So while they wanted a king, they were wanting Jesus to come in. Even his disciples were wanting Jesus to come in and be a revolutionary and be a king in the natural. Unknowingly, they were prophetically bearing witness that Jesus was coming to save them eternally, not momentarily. And they, they wanted him to be king momentarily, but he was going to be king eternally. Then I also want to make note of the fact that he was riding on a donkey. Now in Zechariah chapter 9, we see this that it references riding on a donkey, and I'll, I'll show you something. But in this culture, if, if they were expecting a king to come in, to conquer, to be a revolutionary, then everybody would have expected in their mind, in that culture, in this day, for him to come in on a war horse. He would have been coming in on a, on a, a white stallion in those days. Now, let me explain that in this culture... Kings that came to take over and were going to bring about a revolution like most of the people thought Jesus was doing would not have come on a donkey. Notice there, so there's this confusion because if you go read over in the book of Revelation, it talks about that when Jesus comes, ultimately he's going to come on, on a war horse. And so there, there's kind of this confusion because all of a sudden people have been talking about, this is the one, he's coming, he's coming, but wait, something doesn't look right. And so there's this confusion with the people. They're shouting Hosanna because they're saying, all right, he's finally going to come and do what we wanted him to do. He's finally going to come and be who we thought he was going to be. And he's on a donkey. Now, if a king came on a donkey, it was a reference to a king coming in peace. They did not want a king to come in peace. They wanted... A the king coming in peace represented, uh, uh, on a donkey represented coming in peace, coming in service. Uh, there was also, Jesus came the first time on a donkey, but once again, Revelation tells us that when Jesus comes a second time, that he's going to come on a white stallion, he's going to be the conquering king. Jesus was coming though, and this is, this is what I want to show you. Jesus was coming not to conquer, but to serve. Jesus was coming to put a skin on the Passover. Now, now that I've given you the, the insight into the details, I want us to walk through some of this again and watch this. Up to this moment, there were many elements of Jesus' ministry that he had kept rather quiet and secluded. And he had taught publicly, uh, and he had performed some of the miracles publicly. But on many occasions, he had been prodded by others to step out into the public spotlight and to proclaim to everyone who he was. And he had been pushed to stand up and to call himself the king and the Messiah. But up to this point, he had avoided all of that. If you even go look in the earliest moments um, when, when, at the wedding of Canaan, even his mom was trying to push him out into the public spotlight. And he said, he said, my time has not yet come. Now, no longer was he telling them to be quiet about who he was. No longer was he trying to keep it a secret. Now he is also not telling the people to be quiet uh, who had recently seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. But now everything is changing. The time is, is come. His moment has come. And now he's going public. And Jesus leaves Bethany where, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha live. And now he and his disciples are heading straight into Jerusalem. Once again, remember this. It was very close. It was not, not far from the gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this moment was in such a time of commotion because it was a Passover week. So I want you to get this image further in your mind. Um, once again, the Jews that lived in Jerusalem and all of the Jews from surrounding, surrounding regions came to Jerusalem from all the nations beyond that were at this time. Historians believe, get this in your mind. As they're walking into Jerusalem, approaching Jerusalem, it is believed to be that there's about two and a half million people crammed into the city of Jerusalem at this moment. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, the normal practice for the Passover was that they would have approximately one lamb sacrificed for every ten people. 
So what that tells us is that there was about a quarter million um, lambs that were in and around the city that were there intentionally to be sacrificed for the Passover. Not to mention that all of these people that were there had to arrange for places to stay. They had to buy food from vendors. They, they all rode in on animals that, that came from far places. So you can only imagine the commotion and the hustle and bustle and all that was going on in this moment, all the crowding. And then on top of all of that, there were these sort of making a scene, these people that were going around, they had just seen not long ago Jesus raise this man from the dead right here on the outskirts of the city. And they're going around telling people, this guy who's coming, uh, th th he, there's this guy who we just saw him and, and, and people were saying that he might be this guy, Messiah and he's a miracle worker and he's a great teacher. And by the way, oh, he, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's in Bethany close by. And the people were waiting in this moment because they were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. They were waiting for this coming Messiah the one that they've been reading about and been taught about for hundreds of years. And because generations pass, when the people became oppressed, when they went into slavery to other nations, God would always raise up somebody amazing like a Moses or a Samson or somebody like that. And so the people naturally assumed that Jesus, if he was the Messiah, that he was going to do the same. That he was going to set them free from the captivity of the Roman Empire. And he was going to be this zealot. And he was going to be this revolutionary. And he was finally going to be freedom and topple the Romans in the process. And one of the main reasons for that, as you likely have heard me mention before, is the fact that all of these prophecies about Jesus coming as a Messiah or about the coming Messiah... There were two kinds of prophecies about the Messiah that was coming. One that portrayed him as the liberator of Israel. And most people quickly would know and could quickly quote the prophetic writings. And even his disciples would reference them. But there were also other times that it mentioned in the text that there were some things written about the coming Messiah that somehow they forgot about. And I actually believe that the Lord allowed their minds to be veiled uh, for, the, for Jesus' first coming because for whatever reason their minds were veiled about Jesus walking out these fulfillments right before them. One of those was that it says right here that as he approached Jerusalem that he got on a donkey and sat on it as he was riding into the city. Now let me remind you once again that the city is, is uh, it's overcrowded. There's all of this commotion because it's a Passover week and because of the conversations that were about him going around he was right... Does it get any more exciting than the fact that he, somebody's just been raised from the dead? And all of a sudden, this might be the Messiah. And so all of this stuff is going on. Who could this possibly be? And he's getting popular. And even though people had never met him, they didn't see his Facebook page. They didn't see him on Instagram. They didn't see the miracle on YouTube. All they heard is, this guy is coming. And all of a sudden, now here comes this guy. And then having everyone who believed in the coming Messiah, they happened to be in the same place at the same time because it was a Passover week. And then, because some of the people ran from Bethany, Bethany to Jerusalem, made it known that this was the teacher, this was the man of miracles, this was the one who raised the dead man. And because it was being discussed that Jesus was not only rumored to be this miracle worker teacher, but possibly the very one that they'd been waiting for, the Messiah. Therefore, this massive crowd is gathered at the entrance of the city through the gates, and they're watching him come up the hill with all of his procession. And you can almost feel the anticipation as you imagine uh, 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 it all kind of coming together in the eyes of everyone. They're, they're thinking about all the prophecies of him coming. They'd heard the stories. They'd watched the miracles. And if you've ever been in a very large crowd of people where there was not a sound system, where there was no musical instruments, and you hear all of those people, and they're singing, and they're celebrating, and there's thousands and thousands of people, and you can feel their shouts as they're shouting all in unison, Hosanna, 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 and the ground would rumble with that many people. They had dreamed of this day. But let me stop right there and begin to point out how this moment of celebration anticipation and excitement began to change as all of a sudden things started to be seen that were not what people thought they would see. 
You see, in, the, in, in this culture, they expected anyone who was claiming to be a, a liberating king or a revolutionary to display certain traits. And one of them definitely was not riding in on a donkey. Everyone knew that the king or the conqueror would only be sitting on that white horse. That was their mental image. And so as they're probably looking down uh, the direction of Bethany, and they're saying, where is he? Who is he? Which one? Which one? At some point, a good percentage of the crowd said, that guy on a donkey? It didn't, it didn't match up to their expectations. But Jesus shows up on a donkey, not as his strong liberator, but rather as a lowly and humble teacher, gentle and kind. And the people's beliefs begin to erode. What is this humility? What is this peace? We're looking for a powerful leader. We're looking for a Samson. We're looking for somebody like that. And while Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah that they had read about, that had been prophesied about, he was coming the first time as a lamb and not the lion. And he was coming as a lamb during the Passover to actually become the eternal lamb of God to be sacrificed. Not what they wanted. They wanted the conquering ride horse. But what they needed was a lamb that would take away their sin. And while they expected and awaited him to be the one who liberated them all from the clutches of, of Rome, he instead came to liberate them from the clutches of sin so they just did not understand all of these moments in time. All of us have the same thing. There are some of you that may be in this room today. Maybe you came here today and you were, maybe you've been a Christian for many years and you came in today with some great need and you said, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to expect this. And God might just meet your need right here in this moment. But sometimes our expectation does not meet up to God's plan. And they were coming in expecting something that they knew that God was able to do. That's why they were excited about it. And you came in today and maybe you came in with an expectation that you wanted God to do something because you know that he is able to do it. But sometimes God will set aside our expectation for the moment and set aside what we want and give us what we really, really need. And that's where the trust in his goodness comes in. Because here's the thing. Here's where all the confusion was. And I'll bring it to a conclusion here in a moment with this. I want you to think about this for a moment. All throughout Scripture, there are prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Going all the way back really to Genesis chapter 3, when the first prophecy of the cross was seen. All through the centuries, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Foreshadows, types, all of these things that piece together what this Messiah would look like. And here's what happened in this moment in time. All of these people, all of their life, for generation after generation, the generation before would teach the generation after God's word and all the details about the Messiah. But somewhere along the way, and I believe that it was in God's sovereignty, that he allowed them to see all of the prophecies of Jesus' coming as a conqueror, as the one who would have the government of the, on, on his shoulders and all of that like his prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And he, all of these different things, one after another after another. And they begin to build up in their mind. And generation after generation, they would tell stories of what they thought it was going to look like, what they thought it was going to, how it was going to unfold and all that. And, uh, and all of a sudden, what ended up happening is they got to this place in time and Jesus is coming. And in their minds, they're only thinking about Jesus coming as a, la as a lion but somehow it did not compute in their minds that there was two comings of the Lord. One of them, he was coming as a conquering lion. And we know that there will be the thousand year reign of Christ and all that stuff. But what God allowed them to have veiled over their eyes was the fact that first he had to come as a lamb to be sacrificed. In this moment in time, they are crying out, Hosanna, save us. And they meant save us from Rome. But he meant Save us from eternity. If they had of thought that he was coming, he was really the one that was going to hang on the cross, I think they would have been afraid to allow him to be crucified. Sometimes the Lord will allow us to not see what we could see so that we don't get in his way. Oh, let me say that again. 
there are times when he will keep us from seeing the entire story and will allow certain parts of our understanding to be veiled so that we won't get in his way of doing what is ultimately best for us. Because the understanding that you and I have now is who cares if he came as the lion and the conquering king if we were still dead in our trespasses and sins. Because really if you look at what's more important was that he came as the, li- as the lamb. Because as the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. And if there is no forgiveness of sin, then we're all hopeless. But he did come, and he did shed his blood, and he did shed his innocent blood, and he was a sinless Savior, and he did die, and he was crucified, and he did hang on a cross, and he was buried in in the grave. And after the third day, he rose from the grave, and he did ascend into heaven, and he is coming again as the lion has promised. And because of that, we all have hope today. Amen? Amen. Amen.